This is the second part of the webinar I had with um, Mitchell Baldridge. If you run a small business and you're interested in tax deferment strategies or tax credits, um, be sure to check out this episode. You're gonna really enjoy it. And um, as always, check the show notes for links to the services we recommend. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. Mitchell, 1031. What is a 1031 exchange and um, how does it work and how does it kind of fuel this snowball rolling down the hill of what is the nirvana for real estate investors is long-term tax efficient cash flow. Yeah. Yeah. Real so, estate, real estate, and, and, and just a little bit more on that. Moses Kagan is a mentor of mine, friend. Everybody knows him through Twitter. He talks a lot about the fact that sponsor sponsors like me who raise the money and we're working on a promote, and we're trying to maximize yield and IRR. The best interest for us is buy a property, make it more valuable and sell it as quick as possible. That is not tax efficient. A lot of people who are in this chat listening, whether they're buying real estate themselves or they're running a PE shop or they're starting to just, they have their snowball rolling down the hill and selling properties means massive amount of tax bills. They're trying to think about long-term tax efficient cash flow. Generally, that means holding properties, holding properties for a long time, because if you don't sell a property, you never have that capital gains and that recapture to pay. But let's talk about how even that there's a, there's a, there's a strategy if you're going to sell a property to uh, keep your basis and, and roll it into a new deal. Um, so yeah, that this idea of never sell is a great idea, but sometimes you get the godfather offer and you have to sell, or sometimes you just go, Hey, I have this whole portfolio and this is the crappiest property in my portfolio. And it, it's, it's worth the same as the other nine properties. So I'm going to kick this dog to the curb and, and replace it. Well, this 1031 exchange allows you to um, basically find a replacing replacement like kind property. So you can take your apartment complex, sell it for, you know, $10 million. The, the rule is you have to replace all the equity, all the debt. So you, you have to find something that's $10 million and $1 to replace it. Otherwise, every dollar you take out is going to be capital gain right off the top. So you can take this $10 million property and go buy a $11 million property and basically roll forward your basis from property to property. It's worth noting that like, you need to replace all the 1245 and 1250 property. But you cannot go take an apartment building and like kind into land or you will have recapture because you okay. you have to replace kind of all the elements of the property, but it allows you to just keep snowballing, you know? Okay. So, so basically you're saying that I have a basis of a million bucks, but now my property is worth three. I sell my property for three. I'm going to declare that I'm doing a 1031 exchange. I'm going to fill out the form. I'm going to find a qualified intermediary to hold my funds. And I have a certain amount of days. How many days is it before I have to identify the property? And then how many days until close on a new property that's in the same class that is greater or equal value to what I sold? Yeah. So there's a, there's a 45 day and a 90 day, and then you have 180 days to do the whole thing. So you have 45 days to nominate. Uh, several replacement properties. And then you have 180 days to acquire the replacement property. So okay. you, you, you basically have to get going down the road and uh, you know, they always joke that like the 1031 buyer is the best buyer you could ever have. Cause you know, they can't horse trade, you know, they can't back out. They, they're kind of stuck. So it, you don't want to go do a bad deal just to not pay tax and just to keep compounding because you can lose more than 20% or 25% or even 37% buying a crappy deal with leverage. So, and the, uh, always, and, act and a big example, a big example of a, of the, the largest and ballsiest 1031 exchange that I've ever seen is Jay Shaminsky out Jay. in, <laughs> yeah, uh, in Texas, in, in Texas, he sold a portfolio of storage facilities for over a billion dollars. Um, $1.5 billion. And he 1031 did into uh, $1.6 billion of multifamily and storage. And he had 180 days to get this done. And he tells the story on episode 72 of the Nick Huber show. So if you type in on your podcast steps, Nick Huber show, uh, episode 172, it's got a yellow header. Um, 
or episode 72 with Jay Shaminsky. Phenomenal listen. Um, okay. Anything else on 1031? A guy says, if you, if you 1031 a fourplex you live in and uh, one, <laughs> never mind. I don't think you can 1031 a place that you live in. It's not, it's not a qualified investment property, right? Well, it, I don't you go talk to a 1031 pro. I just get mm -hmm. like the rules of 1031 go so deep that like getting into odd edge case scenarios right now probably is not. What's a, what's a reverse 1031? Somebody says I own two STRs, $2 million each A and B. I want to sell a, and can I kind of use that as something that I bought B with potentially? Well, if you're, if you haven't bought B yet and you're going to sell a, you can kind of set up this third party by B. You have to have all the cash to replace all the debt and all the equity. And then you can sell A and then you can kind of backwards into it. Normally it's you sell the property and buy the replacement property 180 days later. There is a scenario where you can buy the replacement property and then sell the original property if, if it's a timeline issue. Again, you need a good qualified intermediary, a good yep. 1031 expert to to yep. walk you through. Which is an a, which is an attorney. You need good you need good attorneys to to pull off 1031s. They're yep. they're high stakes. So um step up in basis, Mitchell. Um we can describe this yep. one pretty quickly. Um, as far as I understand it, I own a hundred million dollars worth of storage, or I bought it for a hundred million. I hope it's worth more. Let's say someday it's worth five hundred million and I'm 80 years old and I have a bunch of kids and I die. And the ownership yep. transfers from me to my kids, the basis steps up to fair market value. And my kids can then start depreciating the stuff again and just take massive W2, get a cost seg study done on the entire portfolio, start depreciating it again, or sell it with no capital gains. Is that is that really yeah. what happens here? Tim's gonna be a real estate pro when when you're <laughs> my going. son, Tim, uh, yes. Uh so you have a lifetime exemption of you know, married couple today, 26 million about, you know, individual person about 13 million, that's going to go down in a few years. So you, you may want to think about estate planning as it sits right now. But, you know, that that's always the thing that's looming, that's going to come back down that they kick down the road. So basically, $26 million of your lifetime estate, you can die with $26 million and push that to your and, and to be, all and your assets and to be clear, I think there's a little bit of confusion there. To be clear, twenty six yeah. million is the tax free gift amount. You can gift or pass down twenty six million dollars worth of stuff if you're married. Thirteen yep. million individually, you can pass that down to your to whoever you want, gift it to whoever without it being taxed for the person who received it. Is that correct? That's right, okay. and so, or without your estate being taxed forty percent. So, you know, basically, normal people who don't have $26 million estates. When you die, all your rental property that you own in your corpus and your, you know, direct control gets stepped up to its value at the date of your death. And then the whole cycle continues. So okay. your kids get to revalue it, redepreciate it, or go sell it, you know, six months from the date you die. And buy for foreign cars. <laughs> And yeah, and by if you're if you're still listening, uh, 189 people in here ask some questions. I'm going to be monitoring the questions, and we'll answer a couple more for sure. Let's talk about opportunity zones very briefly here, Mitchell. Sure. Um, I'll describe what that is. The government has set aside areas of growth, areas that they would like real they'd like to uh, encourage investment in, and these are drawn on a map around cities and non cities, and they're what's called opportunity zones. They're generally in um, lower income areas that the county and the cities want to lift up, but not always. And um, if you buy a property in an opportunity zone and you do more than 50% of the purchase price of the property in improvements to the land, and that is that 50% correct? Um, so it, you have to, it, it's based on the improvement value of the land. So it, it works great for new development because yep. if it's raw land and you put a dollar into it, you qualify versus, uh, you know, if, if you buy a building, you for 10 million. Let's say we to, buy a building for a million dollars, then we got to put 500 grand into it. Is that correct? 50% of the You, you got to substantially improve the improvement property of the building. And, and if you roll in this, capital proceeds, if you roll in proceeds from a sale and you have a big capital gain, let's let's say I let's say five years ago I bought a property for five million. This year I sold it for 20 at a 50 15 million dollar gain. 
but I designate it all for opportunity zone. I put it in a special account, get the legal work done. And I go buy properties that are in these opportunity zones. I do the required improvement, which means construction, expansion, making the properties better. And I hold them for 10 years. I hold that property for 10 years. Then I can sell the assets and no capital gains. No capital gains. You're able to defer the tax for a few years going in. You still have to pay the tax on that gain. So don't put the whole 15 in. But also, yeah, going forward, correct. No capital gains and automatic step up in basis. So no recapture. So it really complements uh, depreciation well, which we're going to, the next one of these, we're going to have Barrett Lindbergh on yep. and he's going to tell us like all the way down to the core of the core about what this is. He He's a, the the most qualified OZ expert I've ever met. <laughs> yep. Yeah. There's a lot account. of different areas that are opportunity zones. There's a lot of different stipulations about where the money comes from. You said it's only deferred. The interesting part about this is that the capital gains and the and the proceeds tax are only deferred for a couple of years. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? When it first came in, um, they were saying basically we were going to defer capital gains for several years. You were going to get a markdown on the capital gain. Uh, you were only going to have to pay 80% of the capital gain and you weren't going to have to pay the tax until 2023. I wish I had studied about this before this call, but uh, you know, <laughs> it, and then yeah. they even kicked the can down the road a little bit. And then it went down to, you would only have to pay 90%. Or, you know, so first it was 80, then it was 90. Now you still have to pay a hundred percent of the tax on the capital gain, but you get a couple of years not to pay it. So the, the idea is like, do not put your entire capital gain into mm -hmm. the OZ because you're still going to have to pay taxes on the capital gain. But regardless, it's a way to take that money, stick it into a, a highly kind of volatile, hopefully in a good way area that's improving rapidly and into a very, very, very capital intensive asset that, that is going to improve a lot, whatever either the new development or the building is, hold it for a long period of time, 10 years. And then again, at the end of that whole period, tax-free uh, you know, exemption on all the gains, exemptions on all the recapture it's all good you know i think it's fair to say though that when opportunity zones were introduced was it 2017 that that became a yep. thing mitchell when when they were introduced everybody thought it was gonna be the next huge you know sure. tax strategy utilized i think it's pretty fair to say that it's been very underwhelming the amount of investments that's flown yeah. in just because i mean look you, you gotta a you gotta have all these capital gains B, you got to go through a lot of legal work to set up these funds. C, you got to yep. hold these, you got to do the, do 50% improvements. You got to do massive construction value add to these houses, yep. to these, whatever it is you buy. And C, you got to hold it for 10 years, 10 year hold period. So yes, opportunity zones are amazing. There are a few people doing it really well. We'll definitely talk to Barrett about it. But overall, 99% of people listening to this right now will never need to worry or think about opportunity zones. Fair enough. And um, it, it, yeah, so the uh, uh, the investment standard is ninety percent for QOB substantial improvements. So you you basically have to take a million dollar building and put a million bucks into it to to make it substantially improved. So Can yeah, it, it's a, kind of. A, go ahead. It's not on our agenda, but I you know there's four or five L which we're going to discuss for a second. Can you can you give us the 30 or one minute spiel on historic tax credits and the in the basic outline of okay if you're doing xyz you should look into tax credits and here are the basics of tax uh, historic tax credits. Yeah, so there's a national historic tax credit uh program and there's also a uh you know states counties different jurisdictions have their own tax credits or incentives there's LITEC, there's low income housing you know there are a million different real estate credits. And again, like going back to the very beginning of depreciation, this is all an incentive structure to get people to do what the government wants you to do, which is lever up and take a bunch of freaking risk and buy or build or improve property and then go rent it to people so that they can either live there or store their crap there or work out of there. So yeah, like, I mean, the the bottom line you know, is, is everybody thinks, oh, these real estate investors, they don't pay any tax. It's ridiculous. The government looks at this. They look at this 
the United States, they look at the United States of America and they realize that 330 million people spend 95 to 97% of their time in buildings, in buildings. Yep. They get medical work done in buildings. They work in yep. buildings. They shop in buildings. They eat in buildings and they sleep in buildings. And all their shit that they buy and order online goes from building to building to building to get to where they are. Yep. You don't, you and, don't really leave that stuff outside. No. And so, and so yes, the government wants to incentivize people like us to go in and buy real estate, to improve real estate, and to invest in real estate, period. Yep. So these are all tax incentives that rightly motivate and reward the people for creating houses, creating places for all of our stuff, creating places to work, <laughs> creating places to get medical work done. So it's your job and it's my job, Mitchell, to tell people about this stuff. And then the people who are investing in the real estate, it's your job to, to learn it. A lot of people who, yeah. one of the big problems with this is that a lot of people who buy and own and carry real estate for a long time, they're, real estate's a simple business. It really is. Buy it for X, collect Y. It's a great place to put your money. And a lot of people don't really do the work to think about all the different tax incentives. It changes all the time. 2017, a big new strategy came out. You know, another one will come out in 2025 when we're on this same call talking about it. It's a lot of work to keep up on it. And frankly, there's a lot of bad CPAs out there that encourage their clients to just pay a ton of taxes to keep everybody out of doing a lot of work. So that's yeah, my Yeah, I mean, and the riches are in the niches. You know, if you are a real estate developer and you can go become a subject matter expert like Barrett has about opportunity zones and you can go carve out your own world that really plays well with tax incentives in a certain jurisdiction or in the U.S., uh, it, you can raise unlimited capital and you can crush. So, you know, that just like, yep. He's and done. you can get and, very, very, very wealthy. I mean, you look at all the real estate families that are, you know, billion dollar family offices, real estate is a massive part of that snowball rolling down the hill. Because when you're making money through a W-2 or you're making money through a small business every year, 37, 40, even 50% if you're out West in California, goes to Uncle Sam and your snowball rolling down the hill Every time it rolls down the hill, another revolution, it gets chopped in half. Roll it down the hill a little bit more, chop it in half. But if you build wealth so, through real estate, it's a massive snowball that can be incredibly tax efficient so that you're not only saving tax money, you know, let's say you make a million dollars a year, you're, you're keeping 500 extra thousand dollars a year. You put that 500 grand to work in more real estate and you can then the snowball, the, the compounding that can happen is just absolutely incredible. So yeah, before we wrap up um, or get into Q&A. Well, I want to you know, have another section. I want to have another section. Yeah. We got a couple more questions, but I want to have a small part about small business because a lot of people on this call are entrepreneurs and they're running small businesses. And well, I want to talk about 179. I want to talk about employment retention credits. I want to talk about um, mileage logs even because there's some things that people can do that can really make a difference that they don't necessarily know about. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's that's where I'm going. Is uh, you know you you brought up four five L and it's worth bringing up tax credit hunter right here. We've uh, hired an awesome guy Chris out of uh, a big name tax firm and who who was working on you know humongous tax credits for humongous companies, and we've uh, already started helping people doing some R and D credits, doing a bunch of VRC credits, and doing these four five L credits out there. So starting with four or five L, because that's most real estate focused, that that is a, a credit similar to the kind of substantial improvement and threshold for an OZ fund. People who buy and redevelop or develop from the ground up properties that are multifamily properties, and they develop them to the standard of being energy efficient, are eligible for this four or five L credit, which is $2,500 per developed unit. So we've seen a ton of our clients, you know, developing these 200, 300 unit, uh, two story apartment complexes. You know, we're doing one right now where, um, I think they're doing about 280 units, you know, times $2,500 per unit. And so uh, that's a massive yeah, that's, opportunity. That's a 150 grand. I think the it's seven if you're if you're, if you're seven hundred thousand dollars yeah yeah if you are uh, if you're developing real estate and especially multifamily 
there is a ton of credits available for you. Four or five L is amazing. Four or five L is mostly energy efficiency, right? Is that what it's for? It's it's windows, yep. doors, insulation. If you get your properties up to a certain energy efficiency rating, you get that $2,500 per unit, boom, Which, free money. If you're, I mean, if you're in California or if you're in a lot of municipalities, the energy efficiency rating for four or five L is it's in the code, the building code. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. You're, you're going to have to overbuild just to hit building code. So it, ground up developers, yeah, four five L is for kind of lower, and then there's one seventy nine D that's for high rises and commercial and and office construction. Um, so that, that that's something we're talking about. And then yeah, we're talking about ERC credits, the the old COVID employee retention credits. Yep. Let's shift over to and, small business now. I want to. I'll, yeah. I'll lead off by talking about my favorite you know, micro business hack when it comes to um, uh, tax efficiency is the mileage per diem, mileage uh-huh. and per diem. Um, a lot of people you see go out and buy a, a vehicle, which section 179 is my second favorite. I'm, I'm all for buying a vehicle and deducting it all in year one. You buy a 30,000, you know, if you're to be uh, applicable for section 179, it's got to be over 6,000 pounds or 5,000 pounds. So it's got to be, can't be a very small sedan, but you can deduct the whole purchase price of a vehicle, farm equipment, whatever it is, year one dump truck. Um, I like actually driving an old vehicle and did this for 10 years, like from 2010, 2011, when we founded our company to 2020, when we sold it, I drove a 2009 Camry. And at first it was 2002 Camry for the first five years. And that car got 35 miles per gallon and it was virtually free um, to operate. My cost per mile to own the thing was like eight cents a mile plus fuel was another, you know, 20 cents a mile. And so I'm all in for under 30 cents a mile and I could, and I could keep a mileage log. Like I'm going from Boston to my self-storage facility in Ithaca and round trip, it's 480 miles. I can deduct then $250. So yep. 55 cents a mile, but the fuel and cost of my vehicle was only 90 bucks. And when you do 20, 30,000 miles a year, driving around, driving your personal vehicle around for business, that's substantial. We're talking at the end of the year, I had a mileage log. It was all in a Google doc, where I started, where I went, how many miles it was. And that mileage log with 20,000 miles on it of where I was driving, that was a $10,000 deduction for me. Ten thousand dollars. One of my best friends, uh, he was an oil, uh, a landman who would drive her all around, you know, Kansas and and the shale plays, and and he had a two thousand three crappy Toyota, and he called it his cash cow because he was <laughs> billing back his employer for you know fifty two cents a mile, and and enjoying that. So he he was getting real money, not just a deduction. So yep. uh, let's let's talk about it. let's talk about ERC, um, and that's what Tax Credit Hunter is. So if you Basically, if you run a small business and you have employees, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to explain it once again because I think this is a good dynamic that you and I have here. Yeah. Is the way I understand employment retention tax credits, if during the pandemic your business had a drip, a dip, or a noticeable decline, and their case can be made for that in many different areas, and you did not lay off your employees from 2000, 2000 beginning of 2000 all the way through the end of 2022, or you can correct me on the time frame you're eligible for an employee retention tax credit, which is 26 up to $26,000 per employee. Um, an example of this is there's many that we're doing these. We're working on many of these at taxcredithunter.com. So if you appreciate what we're doing and you think that you can trust us, go to taxcredithunter.com and you can have a consultation with our guy, Chris, and he will tell you if we can make a case and whether or not we can do a very legitimate ERC tax credit study. Um, but yeah, if you... Uh, one example is my buddy has a eight person plumbing company, literally eight person plumbing company. And for three months after COVID, the house call stopped and he had four, four really bad months. <laughs> then business picked back yeah. up and he kept his eight employees around, kept them busy. And boom, he gets a $200,000 check as an employee retention credit. Um, another one is a big company. We have a, a mutual friend who we did, you did the study for Mitchell that had 200 employees and his employee retention tax credit was closer to a million dollars. Um, but yeah, d- just now, now fill in the blanks there and kind of elaborate on some of the areas that you think I missed. Yeah. So the, the quarters eligible are from March 12, 2020, which I don't know what happened on that day to the very end of 2021. 
you know, really the way we get started looking at these is getting a night, you know, quarter by quarter P and L from January of 19 all the way through the end of 21. And we start to look at quarters that had a big dip. You also look at businesses that, you know, had substantial kind of like shutdown of operations based on uh, laws. And so really, you know, everyone's heard about this at this point. It's it's all over. You're getting ads on the radio. You're getting ads on TV. You're getting people emailing you robocalls. And so like, this isn't a new idea. It's out there. Our pitch is that we're going to do a really good job at it. We're going to charge you a fair price. We're not going to over, we're going to get you what you're entitled to and not a penny more and not a penny less because there's so many um, bad actors out there. There's companies that are getting incentivized. investigated and shut down by the government because they're anybody, <laughs> yes. anybody who comes to them, they're filing out the paperwork, yes. they're sending it in, they're getting the money, they're taking their cut. And it turns out these businesses didn't even have a case for a decline or they yep. didn't even have the employees or it was so, simply all fraud in the first place. <laughs> we have lost customers because they say, well, the guy down the street said I could get you way more. And I'm like, hey, I'm sure he said that. And he maybe can get you more right now, but we are doing these the right way. We know what we're doing. We've done a lot of them. And so our case is a case of trust of we've given you a lot of good information over the years. And I gave two real examples, the small, the small plumbing company and the large company that's a sure. mutual friend. Do you have a, another example of ERC credits in, in action that somebody listening to this might be able to, um, you know, take advantage of. And I, and then after that, I got a couple of questions yeah. here that I want to ask um, before we wrap this thing up. Yeah. I mean, uh, we've done uh, hair cutter that was shut down a long time and, you know, continue to pay their employees, got a big claim for them. Drive so you can through. use, P hold on, let me, let me clarify this. You can sure. use PP uh, payment protection. PPP. You can use PPP, continue to pay yep. your people by the government's money then kick your business back up and it's running and now you're making money again. And then you're still eligible for ERC, which is another credit on top of it. Yeah. And you can't double dip. So it becomes a complex calculation and the more complex the business gets, it becomes even more complex. There was also one for startup businesses where certain startup businesses that, that occurred regardless of whether they were affected or not, that paid wages have some eligibility. So we can send some more information out to the people who are on this call of kind of who might be a fit for this. But, you know, a, a lot of businesses are a fit that think, golly, I uh, didn't know I would be. And yeah, I already got PPP, but you're, you're not going to get a double dip on that. And then a lot of businesses who, you know, it, it, certain restaurants that just switched to takeout only and, and ran up booming businesses still qualify because their dining room was shut down and they had to move mm -hmm. out to the patio. Um, you know, or a business, certain... the plumbing, the plumbing company had commercial work shut down for, yep. you know, three months, basically the, all the job sites shut down, yep. but they were still doing house calls to fix people's toilets. So they had yep. a case, but it, they had a drop in revenue that was substantial, but you also get, you know, a lot of businesses where they go, Hey, well, yeah, do we qualify? We, we were effective, but then, you know, pool cleaning businesses just had the best years of their life. So, <laughs> you know, it doesn't qualify for everybody, but our, our pitch is we can help you pretty quickly figure out if you qualify. And if you do qualify, we're going to work with you to get it right and not get you less than, than what you're entitled to and, and not get you more than what you're entitled to and, and get you in trouble. And we're going to charge you a fair price. So to get That's on a call good. with Chris, to get on a call with Chris is just go to taxcredithunter.com and fill out your information. Fill out. All the right, form. let's talk. Let's talk about QSBS, um, qualified yep. small business. What is it? That's the last one. Stock, stock, qualified small business stock. And the way yep. I understand this is that if you start a business and you declare that you are QSBS, um, it's got to be a C corp, which is a unique uh, filing. Most are LLC. This is a C corp. Yeah. Um, and you hold the business or hold those shares for five years. There's some yep. ways around that. There's some nuance there. And you sell your business. Um, the first $10 million of the sale price is tax-free, Mitchell? Is it tax-free? Exempt, yeah, to you and all your LPs. So 
this is, I mean, this is Silicon Valley stuff. Every one of these, you know, this is not really kind of main street as much as it is, uh, you know, seated tech companies. If you go raise money from Andreessen Horowitz, they're not going to give you money unless you're a C Corp. And unless the shares are QSBIS eligible, and you're going to certify to that. And, and that's the, one of the biggest kind of cohorts. And, and then all these funds now, w- when they return that to every one of their LPs, every one of every bit of that is QSBS eligible. So, so that's Silicon a big... Valley, not only Silicon Valley, not only burns all kinds of cash, but then they, at the end, when they finally go public and sell their yep. C Corp shares, everybody gets their returns tax free baby yep and i always but thought this is, like they wanted this is go ahead oh i always thought they kind of like wanted these c corps to be opaque so that they wouldn't have to mark down the value of the shares and they wouldn't have to deal with the k1s and like that's a feature but the real feature is qsbs that's why yep. every one of these tech companies is structured as a c corp out there and a c so there's the llc and i'll i'll do my best to explain this and you can correct again um there's a there's an LLC, which is what a cash most cash flowing businesses, it's a pass through entity, taxes an S Corp, and the 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 entity just issues a K1 and the and the money flows right to the individual. And I pay individual income tax on it. The corporation itself doesn't pay any tax itself. It all passes down to the shareholders. That's the ideal method if you have a cash flowing business. If you're generating cash every month, it's the ideal method. Because if you're a C Corp, if you're a C Corp, the cash is stuck in the business. The business files a return. It's at corporate tax rate. But to pay yourself out of the business, then you pay basically W-2 salary income uh, you know, on the money that or you're dividends. pulling out of your business. Or or you get or you pay a dividend out of the business. So you get double taxed one way or another. The, the corporation pays tax, and then whatever's left to get it out either has to come through as salary or as a dividend. So you get and salaries, tax, you're hit so on all... FICA salaries, you're hit on FICA and workers comp and dividends. The corporation has to pay first and then the dividends are spit and taxed twice. So that's where you hear double taxation. Yep. And so it, you said one thing, which is, you know, an LLC can be anything. You can check the box and become a C Corp. You can make the election to be a C Corp. It would just default to being a single member disregarded LLC or it would default to being a multi-member partnership, or you can elect to be an S corp. I mean, and again, the entity selection and why you do what is an entire rabbit hole. But the, the, this the is why advice. this is why attorneys and good CPAs like Mitchell can save you a ton of money if you're making yep. these decisions early on. People come to you, Mitchell, yep. when they've already sold or they're about to sell their company. And it's too late to make these structural decisions that can have massive, massive tax implications. So yep. if you're starting a company, if you think that company could get big, if you think that company could sell for one, two, ten million million down the road, talk to somebody about the current tax code. The, the other um, tax credit hunter item to talk about is R&D credits, which we've been doing a lot for a lot of, you know, people out there, which is the the idea that you're developing new novel technology or new novel process if you're a software company or if you're a engineering firm or if you are mm. a, uh, we have a so client. The, so who, let, let's just use RA cost second as an example. We have six engineers working on building our model and our methodology of our kind of our software system almost now that helps us with these cost segs. That money is, let's say we spent $200,000 last year as an example, Mitchell. What, how does the R&D tax credit work in that regard? Yeah, so that's a new novel technology. And and we are um, going to be able to apply for a credit, which the difference between a credit and a deduction is a credit is dollar for dollar. You, you know, $1 of credit is $1 less of tax. Whereas, you know, going back to the beginning of this call, valuing these cost seg deductions, you have to multiply them by your tax rate. Uh, valuing a credit, it doesn't matter what your tax rate is because a dollar is a dollar. So, wow. so, tw- we're gonna- so, so the ERC credit, for example, is $26,000. That's like a coupon that says I'm paying $26,000 of taxes. So it basically protects 
50,000 or 60,000 or 70,000 of income from taxation because the credit means, hey, I'm giving you this credit in exchange for you not making me pay tax. Is that a correct yeah, way to say and it? Yeah, I mean, in the ERC credit's a refundable credit, which is, uh, you know, a whole different deal. That, the so child... if you don't have tax, if you don't have any tax, you can take cash instead. It's like a voucher that says, hey, this is cash yeah. that you can use to pay taxes or not. The child tax credit, for example, of, you know, you have four kids, you get this $8,000 credit, even if you make $40,000 as a single person and, and effectively pay no tax. So, yeah. So the R and D credit, it, you know, it's a study of who worked on what and who did eligible work that is a R and D credit uh, worthy work. You know, Chris gets on a call with you. You have an interview. We you talk about what your supplies were, who your employees are, what your employees do to push the ball forward towards these. You know, again. It's all an incentive game. The government wants you to develop new and novel technology, whether it's Make bio human life better or software. Makes America makes America yeah. better. Yeah. You know. So uh, I, we have a question on ERC and um R and D. Is there a minimum sure. number of employees required, or could it be a two or three person company that does these things? I know it becomes not really financially feasible to get the studies done if you're too small. Yeah. Uh, there there is like a, you know when we do these, we want to have a minimum fee. I mean, or, and, mm -hmm. and so the really small ones, you'll either get kind of stuck in the queue or we'll frankly just tell you it's too small or, yeah. it, you know, as we spin up, you start, we, but we, we also like the small ones because uh, I mean, a lot of these ERCs are getting audited. Like a, a lot of them will be, the IRS has been nasty. They, they are not taking, Oh, I didn't understand for an answer. So <laughs> uh, we don't really want to do the biggest one that's out there, uh, you know, because uh, they're just, mm -hmm. they're going to get audited. They're going to be a pain. I mean, we will do it, but you, you know, we are taking a very measured approach and doing these things the right way. And we don't want to get you audited and uh, we don't want anyone to wind up on the front page of the paper. As, Beautiful. Uh, you're starting to see. Well, this is uh this has been amazing. And to recap, we've talked about um, cost segregation studies with racostseg.com. We've talked about property insurance with titanrisk.com. We've talked about ERC, R&D, and 4-5-L credits with um, taxcredithunter.com. Those are the three sponsors of this show, really, with an emphasis on RE cost seg. Um, Mitchell, man, your wealth of knowledge and uh, we got to do this more often because I think everybody who yeah. tuned into this, which was well over 300 people tuned in live. Um, I think everybody took away things that can save them a lot of money. And uh, and we'll do another live uh, webinar in 60 days and talk about the same stuff because you got to yell, you got to repeat, repeat this stuff from the rooftops. I think you got to yell it and yell it and yell it. And we're going to do one with Barrett too. That'll be exciting. We can bring people in. I mean, it, yeah, to, to Nick's point, what did you like? What did you don't? What did you not like? We're going to follow up with y'all. Come back to us with stuff you want to know and stuff you want mm -hmm. us to do more of and stuff you don't want us to do. We might listen to you. Maybe not. All right. Though. Mitchell, Thanks, it's Nick. been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, we'll, we'll do this again. I appreciate you. Awesome, man. Thank you. Bye. Big news, guys. I created a free PDF that details my method on how I analyze a self-storage facility and figure out what it's worth. Give me a pen, the back of a napkin, and a couple metrics, and I can figure out about what the property is going to be worth to me. Um, if you want to download this PDF, click in uh, the show notes, the first link, and you can give me your email address and you get a uh, email right away with a four-page PDF that outlines exactly how I think about um, underwriting or giving my initial analysis on a self-storage facility. Again, click the link in the show notes and you're going to get that document for free. This episode of the Nick Huber Show is brought to you by RE Cosseg. If you want to maximize your bonus depreciation and minimize your tax liability, make sure to do a cost segregation study on real estate you've recently acquired. RE Cosseg offers the lowest priced fully engineered studies in the business and you get a virtual site visit with a quick turnaround. They did 30 plus cost seg studies for me over the past year, including a short-term rental 
along with my self-storage facilities. And I'm also an investor in the business along with my good friend and CPA, Mitchell Baldridge, who you all know. To learn more about how bonus depreciation works, listen to episode 75 of The Nick Huber Show or visit recostseg.com to go ahead and get a free proposal that outlines the cost of the study and your potential savings. Thanks again, recostseg.com.